I'd like to begin with um, uh, Jerry Firestein, as I've said, uh, former U.S. ambassador to Yemen uh, from 2010 to 2013, and has played many roles uh, at the State Department. Uh, Jerry is filling in for Bruce Rydell, who let me know over the weekend that he could not uh, attend the meeting this morning. Uh, then we'll have uh, Alex uh, Vitanka speak about um, the Iranian side of this dynamic between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And Christian, you will follow up as a discussion. So Jerry, the floor is yours for seven to eight minutes. I will hold you to that time. Uh, everyone speaking today, since, so that we'll try to get through this. But please, Jerry, give us um, an opening summary. Uh, uh, thanks, Stephen. It is, uh, it's a pleasure, and thank you for inviting me uh, to join. I'll try to finish ahead of time and uh, uh, turn over to my, uh, uh, my colleague, Alex Vitanka, who uh, always talks longer than I do. So um, I did have an opportunity to, um, to look at Bruce's chapter, uh, and as you and I uh, discussed, Stephen, um, uh, I'll begin with a disclaimer, which is that uh, I don't necessarily agree with everything uh, that Bruce wrote. And so uh, I'll give my own thoughts and, and not necessarily reflect on, uh, on what, uh, what Bruce's views are. Uh, but let me uh, just say that from my perspective, the Saudi decision to intervene uh, in the uh, Yemen civil war in 2015 was based entirely on uh, their concerns about uh, the, um, the threat of Iranian expansion and the establishment of an Iranian foothold uh, in Yemen uh, in, uh, you know, based on the Houthi move into Sana'a and their coup d'etat against uh, the Hadi government. And I think that in a sense, it reflected a longstanding concern that the Saudis had of seeing themselves uh, as being encircled uh, by, uh, by pro-Iranian forces uh, going, you know, if you go from uh, Iraq, Syria, uh, and Lebanon, and then down uh, the, uh, the Red Sea, uh, Hamas in, in Gaza, uh, Sudan for a period of time, Somalia uh, for a period of time. Uh, and then so Yemen would complete the encirclement. And that was, of course, from a a uh, Saudi uh, strategic perspective, uh, an enduring and existential threat. Uh, the Houthis played up on those fears uh, in 2014. Uh, you know, their announcement that they're opening uh, regular air uh, links between Tehran and Sana'a, uh, as well as threatening statements that the Houthi leadership was making about the, uh, the border between Saudi Arabia and Yemen exacerbated uh, Saudi concerns. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that there was evidence that Iran was expanding its, foot, uh, its footprint uh, in uh, Yemen going all the way back to 2012, uh, long before uh, the, the advent of the circumstances that led to the civil war. Uh, the, uh, the Jihan One, uh, the Iranian Dow that was seized in late 2012 uh, by the US Navy that was uh, carrying uh, tons of weapons for the Houthis. Uh, the earlier seizure of a ship that was bringing uh, EFP milling equipment to, to Yemen uh, for delivery to the Houthis, as well as the presence of IRGC personnel in Yemen, again, long before there was a conflict, long before uh, the, uh, the, this whole uh, situation developed. So that, these were the bases uh, for uh, Saudi concerns. Uh, nevertheless, I mean, the, the reality is that the Saudis uh, maintained a dialogue with the Houthis all through uh, this period. Uh, when I was still in Sana'a, uh, I had a number of conversations with the Saudi ambassador who was, uh, was uh, engaged in, common, in uh, contact with the Houthis. Uh, they were trying to work out uh, that dialogue, which has gone on really for a decade or longer, has waxed and waned over the years, but it's always been uh, a factor. And my view has always been that in the long term, Houthi interests in, uh, in their position uh, really favored them establishing a closer relationship with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is always going to be their neighbor. Iran is always going to be a long way away. 
Uh, but the reality is that the Houthi movement is not monolithic. Uh, there are forces uh, within the Houthi movement that would favor a closer relationship with, uh, with Saudi Arabia, uh, but there are some that are very deeply entrenched in a pro-Iranian mindset. Um, and uh, uh, from a Saudi perspective, uh, they've also been very clear that they don't object to seeing the Houthis play a role in, uh, in Yemeni affairs. I mean, this has been something that they've been very clear on and in public uh, have uh, stated that they don't object. Uh, this is uh, really a question of how to work it out. So uh, basically uh, what I would say is that there are three Saudi red lines. Uh, they have to have a secure border. Uh, they have to have an agreement that there won't be IRGC or Hezbollah presence. Uh, and, there will, and there will be a friendly government in Sana'a. Uh, the Saudis have been looking for an end to the conflict based on those three red lines, at least since 2016, uh, and, uh, and thought that they had a deal in 2016 that fell apart in Kuwait. So from my perspective, and I'll stop here, this will be my last point, the question is more whether Iran uh, sees advantage in helping end the conflict or keeping it going uh, in order to keep pressure on Saudi Arabia and perhaps to drive a wedge uh, between the Saudis and the United States. And let me stop there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alex, if you could uh, give us an opening statement about the Iranian. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, I'm afraid you probably have to move in at some point and stop me. I, I'm, I'm fearful. I've written way more than eight minutes would allow so or maybe not we'll see but do stop me um yeah jerry was short of his time so okay um well again thanks for, for the invitation Stephen, and great to see everyone i'm going to go through a bunch of bullet points um for the sake of uh for time and i'm going to provide you with a sort of uh, to the best of my ability the sort of macro view from tehran's perspective in terms of what is happening in yemen or what has happened over the course of the last uh decade. Um, let me start off with the obvious. In 2015, you know, uh, most of us Iran watchers, I think, were, uh, you know, uh, in agreement that Iran's involvement in Yemen was a card against the, um, the Saudis to bleed it, but to also play that Yemen card at the right moment as part of a political negotiation. And it was seen then, and I think it's seen to this day uh, largely the same way, uh, to play that card in the context, not just in terms of Iran-Saudi relations, but perhaps also in terms of how Iran can play the Yemen card to bring an end to its um, you know, position or pariah status, if you will, in, in Middle Eastern affairs. I hear what Jerry just said, Iran's involvement um, did not start in 2015, as Jerry just laid out. Uh, but as I also laid out in my uh, in my chapter uh, in the book that uh, uh, we're all here to sort of uh, talk about and promote, hopefully, uh, throughout the 1990s and the, uh, most of the 2000s, Iran took uh, what I would describe small steps in terms of being involved in Yemen. Uh, I, I don't really see any evidence to suggest that Iran's involvement in Yemen is some uh, you know, major strategic uh, blueprint that was devised or conceived of at some point in Iran and, and has been implemented ever since. I think events that have shaped Iranian policy much more than any ideological group, blueprint that one might be able to uh, point to. Again, as Jerry pointed out, Yemen is simply too far away from, from Iranian perspective, too complicated. And to begin with, at least, with very few uh, openings for the Iranians to move in uh, with and sort of uh, try and, and gain a foothold. Um, but six years of war has changed a lot of that. I think clearly, uh, if you're sitting in Tehran, you, you believe now that the Houthis have performed much better than Tehran anticipated back in 2015, and the Saudis and allies have, uh, have fallen short. Uh, and I think that would be understatement in terms of military achievements. Um, the growing Houthi military muscle uh, clearly is something that reflects an Iranian desire to invest in, in this Houthi military uh, capability. How much uh, in terms of uh, uh, Iran's involvement in helping the Houthis militarily versus what the Houthis have done themselves or from other sources, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but some of the source, some of the data that the Saudis are putting out there, you know, 800 drone and missile attacks over the course of this war, you know, if that is true, and I have no idea of, of, of knowing whether this 
figure of 800 of drone and missile attacks is true, but it is true, then, you know, clearly uh, those point to Iranian military strengths, the drone and miss ballistic missile uh, capabilities. Um, uh, so in other words, I think the, the, the Houthis um, uh, became over the course of the last five or six years gradually more wordy as a as a, uh, a partner as an entity to invest in but let's not lose sight of the fact that the regional rivalry with the saudis and the united states uh, was a key factor in this the coming of the trump administration and the arrival of king salman and his son mohammed bin salman um, uh, you know uh, clearly uh, required the, for, for the iranians to rethink perhaps the, the way they looked at their involvement in yemen uh, less so as a sort of a card to play when the uh, opportune moment presented itself, but more as a long-term commitment uh, because of what they predicted to be a long-term tensions with, with Riyadh under the new leadership that came uh, following King Abdullah. Um, at this point in the Yemen conflict, I think the Iranians have come to the conclusion that the Saudis have lost uh, and that Yemen is now a card, as I said, a, a bargaining chip for Iran to, to be able to play. I suspect they want to play it in a regional format uh, and, and not in a bilateral format with the Saudis, if for no other reason, the fact that the Saudis are not ready at this point to talk to the Iranian bilaterally. Um, the fact that the Iranians want to sort of elevate their public uh, uh, role in the Yemeni conflict and their ability in clout in that country, I think was best re reflected by the October uh, 2020 decision to send uh, Ambassador Hassan Irlu um, to uh, Yemen uh, after five years of Iran not having had an ambassador. Uh, the timing to me suggested that they felt that you know something major was about to happen and Iran wanted to be much more uh, you know open explicit about what uh, it it had to offer uh, as a as a uh, peacemaker or a power broker, whatever term you want to use. Um, but the, the fact that it took him a year uh, to send an ambassador to uh, Yemen after the Houthis had uh, sent their ambassador to, to Tehran, to me at least suggested it, that the Iranians were still caution, uh, cautious at this point. And as a side note, let me just point out, and everyone on this call knows this, but Hassan Irlu, the new ambassador, is clearly a man from the Revolutionary Guards. And that shows you who runs Iran's Yemen uh, uh, policy in, in, in uh, uh, you know, as they do in Iraq and Syria. So this is not Javad Zarif's foreign ministry, people who are in charge of this file. This is clearly a revolution guards uh, file that is being maintained by them. Uh, but to suggest that this is, uh, because I want to touch on the issue of factional politics, to suggest that Yemen is just the darling of the revolutionary guards and nobody else in Tehran cares about it, I think is also an uh, a mistaken belief. Um, I think clearly, um, you know, Ayatollah Khamenei himself is is has in the recent years moved in the direction of, of being overtly in support of what Iran is doing in Yemen. I think as the Supreme Leader, he sets the tone. Um, and I think close advisors of Ayatollah Khamenei, people like Ali Akbar Velayati, who is a pretty powerful, if not one of the most powerful voices on foreign policy in the Supreme Leader's office, he is handling, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, much of Iran's Yemen uh, affairs. So to, to quickly wrap up here uh, for this uh, uh, part, I see Yemen's uh, role, uh, I'm sorry, Iran's role in Yemen in three phases since 2014. I see a opening where there's a deny, uh, denying of any involvement. And then I see the Iranians being silent about charges that are being leveled against them to the present day where the Iranians are openly boasting about being supported, supporters of the Houthis and an entity that needs to be uh, on board for any political solution to happen as far as the Yemen conflict in, is concerned. And Stephen, let me just spend a minute or two on uh, some, some points that might be of interest for our conversation which is about the, the sort of broader geopolitics of, of, of this uh, Iranian um, involvement in Yemen. It used to be uh, that Iran looked at Yemen as a conflict between Iran and the Saudis, the United States and the United Arab Emirates. As we know, the UAE is more or less out of it. Uh, they chose to get out of it. Uh, and the Iranians don't really pressure the UAE over the Yemen issue any longer. If there is pressure on UAE, it's over UAE's relations with Israel, not so much what, what they're doing in Yemen. Uh, the Iranians believe that the 
obviously the Saudis and the Americans want to get out of the Yemen war or, or bring it to an end. Um, and there's no sign, as far as I can see, to suggest that Iran would not want to be uh, look for opportunities to bring that about and make itself a stakeholder in that decision-making process. Um, so if that makes sense. So the Iranians do welcome it, and perhaps if they can find a mutually advantageous way of doing it, want to be part of that process. Um, the, the new actor, which I am interesting, uh, interested in following, and I think you know, it represents something new, is the involvement of new actors, particularly the Turks. The arrival of Turkey, which the Iranians, from what I can tell, seem to see as being linked to the cooling of relations between Washington and Riyadh, uh, represents a new set of challenges for the Iranians because they have a bigger regional kind of uh, uh, rivalry with the Turks. And I am following this uh, Iranian uh, uh, fears about what Turkey wants to do in Yemen with, with interest. And I think it is interesting uh, because it brings up the whole issue of what would keep the Turks and the Saudis together in Yemen. And I guess if you're sitting in Tehran, one, one way of looking at it is yes, that the Saudis need military help, they need drones or whatever it is for their military operations since the Americans are reducing their commitment to the Saudi war effort. But I think if, again, if you're sitting in Tehran, the fear might be that what brings the Saudis and the Turks together is something like supporting Isla and the Muslim brothers. And this is a direction, if things went in a direction that would be unwelcome from Tehran's perspective, I, I don't think they want to see that, Turkey making inroads in Yemen on the back of uh, uh, supporting the Muslim brothers. But at the same time, it might present opportunities elsewhere in, a, in this sort of geopolitical competition. For example, the Emiratis would not want to see this. The Emiratis are against any political Islam in the region, and that would, uh, you know, provide Iran with an opportunity to perhaps work with the, with the UAE uh, um, in, the, in the case of, of Yemen. Um, I, I've spoken more than I should. Final words, uh, and I'll stop, Stephen. Give me one minute. Um, as I said to begin with, much in, in Iran's Yemen policy has really been about circumstances, you know, how, how things have shaped Iran's decision, how the Saudis failed militarily and gave Iran an opportunity. And I think to, to a large extent, that is still very much true. Uh, circumstances are very much deciding Iran's next steps. Uh, but one thing that we need to ask ourselves uh, going forward is, uh, Yemen no longer is just a card for, for the Iranians to play, or is it? I mean, that's a question mark for, that I have here for me. Um, but one of the fears we should have, certainly here in Washington, is that if the Iranians decide that it's no longer just a tactical card to play, that Yemen is worthy as a long-term investment, regardless of what happens with Saudi Arabia, that other regional threats from Tehran's perspective, particularly the Israelis in the Red Sea, gives Iran reason to want to stay committed uh, to its Yemen project. And I'll stop there, Stephen. Okay, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, Christian, uh, please uh, give us your reply to both Jerry and Alex, and we look forward to your input. <laughs> okay, well, thank you both for the presentations and thanks for including me in the discussion. I think one of the issues that we all have to bear in mind, which I think both speakers, both Jerry and Alex have alluded to is that Saudi and Iran don't share the similar level of threat perceptions of each other. You know, as Jerry said, the Saudis felt they were being encircled from 2012 onwards. And for Saudi, I think they see a lot of regional policy, regional developments through the Iranian prism, and not only in Yemen, but especially on the Arabian Peninsula, but also in Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq as well. Whereas for the Iranians, Saudi Arabia is not their number one percept threat, kind of perceived threat. And as Alex has said, a lot of Iranian policy, although not all, has to some extent been opportunistic. It's been responding to circumstances. And it hasn't been driven by the same kind of innate fear of encirclement that Saudi policy has. And I think we've seen that play out very strongly in Yemen since 2015 and arguably since before 2015 as well, where the Saudis perhaps overseeing the threat have the beginning perhaps have created conditions where, as Alex has said, the Iranians have deepened their involvement, have deepened their military support, 
for the Houthis and to some extent have contributed to strengthening the Houthis' military capabilities uh, to the point where now, as I think we, we all acknowledge, the Houthis do to some extent hold the cards if the Saudis are to try to find a way of withdrawing from Yemen in a way that kind of respects those three red lines that, uh, that Jerry had spoken about. And of course, the Houthis now have a claim to be at the table in a way perhaps they didn't have it in 2015 when they had seized Sana'a through sort of um, through force. But of course, now they're much more powerful. So we do see a, a difference in threat perception that has really been marked and I think arguably has continued to grow the longer this war has gone on. And of course, as the Saudis have failed to win a military victory or even a sort of military success that would allow them to withdraw with, with, with their objectives obtained, I think going forward, we will see, and I think in my, it's my personal view that the beginning of the war as well in Yemen in 2015, at least the internationalization of the conflict, was also linked to those negotiations going on in Vienna between the P5 plus one plus Iran, where the Saudis to some extent were saying, well, we think that you can't just isolate Iranian nuclear issues from Iran's regionally destabilizing behavior. And so we're going to do something about it. Now, I think we're seeing the same thing now, and to some extent, such perceptions have only been in, intensified by the, the increase in missile and drone attacks on Saudi Arabia since the Biden administration came in to office in, in January. And I think with every new attack on Saudi Arabia, it will strengthen the view of the Saudis and potentially others in the region who are opposed to any kind of re-entry into the JCPOA that it absolutely has to be linked to conversations with Iran on missile issues and on Iran's support for regional proxies. And so I think once again, we're seeing at the end of the six years of conflict in 2021, some of those same regional dynamics where different regional actors are playing to very different, kind of very different international audiences. And so I think that may well uh, contribute to a difficulty in finding a resolution, at least to I suppose the two major Middle East priorities that the Biden administration seems to have focused on in its first months in office, which is finding a way to bring the war in Yemen to some sort of conclusion, and then also finding a way to re-engage Iran, not only on the nuclear talks, but on wider issues as well. So I think just as we saw in 2015, some of these issues coming together in ways that have proven to be destabilizing. So I think we may see the same thing uh, playing forward and of course complicating the Biden administration's attempts to try to move forward on these two uh, issues. Um, and then just finally, I, I mean, I agree, I think with both both Alex and, um, and Jerry that you know, both, well, the Iranians, I mean, I, I would agree actually that Iran does potentially have at least an incentive to keep trying to create that wedge between Saudi Arabia and the US, although by, Paradoxically, I think with the Biden administration having reaffirmed support for Saudi defense, the defense of Saudi Arabia, actually it's driving Saudi Arabia and the, UA, and the US arguably closer together in some respects, because the Saudis can now justifiably claim that they're under attack. And so I think we're going to see the next big issue being, you know, how do you define defensive versus offensive operations and weaponry? But arguably the Iranian, every kind of, attempt by the, every, every attack by the Houthis that can uh, linked, of course, to Iran on Saudi soil now will, I think, create some problems for the Biden administration if they want to try and distance themselves from Saudi Arabia, because arguably it will drive them, it will, it will create that dynamic where the defense of Saudi Arabia is now taking an even greater uh, importance than perhaps it did before 2020. So with that, I'll open, I'll pass back to you, Stephen, and for questions. Thank you, uh, Christian. And uh, uh, all of you are perhaps aware of the attack uh, overnight, right? Or I guess it was last night, uh, our time, um, early morning, perhaps, in Saudi Arabia. It sounded like 11 drones that Ansar Allah says they launched toward Jazan and a few missiles, uh, certainly a conflagration on the ground. It looked very serious. But I, I take your point, Christian. This may have the effect of driving the Biden administration closer to Saudi Arabia. 
Um, I want to open the floor for anyone, and we can perhaps spend a few minutes uh, discussing this, but I'd like to get Jerry, if you could come back in, Jerry, and talk about how you view the Saudi position on this. Um, if Ansar Allah continues these sorts of attacks and, and advances on Marib, that threat remains, you know, that Marib could collapse. Um, how, how serious might this become for Saudi Arabia to further engage in, in conflict? Uh, that, as Christian pointed out, they would define as defensive at this point. Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, from a, from a Saudi perspective, I would say that the worst possible outcome obviously would be uh, one where uh, effectively Yemen was divided and that the Houthis uh, ended up being um, solely in control of the north, meaning solely in control of the Saudi-Yemen border uh, with uh, presumably uh, an independent or uh, certainly a separated south. Um, you know, some people have suggested this. Uh, obviously, the Zaydis, uh, Zaydi Shia are the majority of the north. Uh, the Sunnis are the majority in the South, uh, and therefore that uh, that you could have, you know, kind of a Zaydi Shia uh, Northern Yemen. Uh, that would be, uh, I think, uh, the least acceptable outcome for the Saudis, uh, and therefore uh, they would see uh, Madhab as really being the uh, the critical um, uh, the critical front. Uh, that they need to defend. And we've seen, uh, of course, that even though they have advanced their own uh, peace initiative, they've announced uh, a position that's more or less consistent with uh, the UN uh, slash US uh, position on uh, negotiated resolution. Um, they have, uh, in fact, re, uh, re engaged with the Houthis, uh, both in Madrid and in Sana'a. So uh, I think that from a Saudi perspective, uh, the, uh, the way forward has to be maintaining the stalemate uh, on, the battle, uh, on the battleground, uh, and that would eventually force the Houthis to come back to the negotiating table and look for a political solution. Uh, if the uh, Houthis get control of Madrib, uh, then the, the, uh, the possibility might be that the Houthis, at least some of them, uh, would see that they could once again achieve their goals through military victory. Okay, please, anyone else um, make uh, comments or ask questions at this point? Um, I can throw in with a question. Uh, so I wanted to ask about Saudi and Iran, specifically to a point that Alex brought up, but maybe Christian has some thoughts on this as well. I just wonder what would happen if the Saudis did decide to talk to Iran. So first of all, is that even possible? Um, the Houthis would hate that more than anything. Uh, the, you know, whenever Martin Griffiths first went to talk to Iran, that was, you know, something the Houthis didn't like very much. They prefer Martin to talk to them, not to Iran. Um, and I suspect the same would be for the Saudis. And so I just wonder whether we think it's just a total dark horse option that the Saudis would ever talk to Iran at this stage, or whether we think it's, you know, somewhere in the cards potentially. I can quickly, uh, you know, take, tell you what I think. I see the Iranian government state divided really on the issue of Saudi Arabia. There are those who believe that Saudi Arabia is weak, that Mohammed bin Salman is, uh, has basically weakened the, the kingdom. And this is not the time to sort of uh, want to play friends with the Saudis. We want to keep the pressure on. And I think, you know, the Rouhani and the Zarif and the so-called moderates I've always argued that Saudi Arabia is too important, that you got to talk to them. In fact, they have kept the uh, offer of negotiations or talks with the Saudis, although the Iranians have been very vague about what they want to talk about. They just want to talk for the sake of talking, and the Saudis haven't been ready to do that, as we know. So, I mean, that's where we are. Now, you know, come June, you got a new uh, Iranian president, whatever that means in practical terms, probably not much in this sort of on big strategic issues, but you might have that sort of uh, consensus, a hardened consensus that, you know, there's nothing to talk to the Saudis about, that the Saudis are the reason why there are sanctions on Iran, that they are spending billions of dollars getting the Americans to put sanctions on Iran and doing all sorts of things against Iran behind the curtain. So why talk to them? 
that might be what the consensus will across the board uh, it, it come June and after the Iranian elections. But at the same time, you know, um, if the Saudis soften um, their uh, uh, tone, if you will, um, I, they don't necessarily have to go back to the days of uh, King Abdullah. But if they soften their tone and give the, the, the this, what they call the hardliners in Tehran uh, a reason to want to sit down, um, then that that's, that's definitely a distinct possibility still. Okay, anyone else with a question, comment, before we move on to the second panel? Yeah, Mohammed, please. Um, I have a question, um, and this question um, came to me this morning when I was looking at um, what was happening with uh, the university that got caught on fire in Jizan. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Um, are we, is there is a point where Saudi will decide that the Houthis are such a threat that they're going to go and completely fully engage in a ground war? Or would they just um, raise the white flag and move on? Yeah, I posed this question to Jerry and not uh, on online in emails. You know, Jerry, what do you think of the Saudi view? How accepting are they going to be of a Ansar Allah rival that seems very strong militarily. Yeah, I, I, um, I mean, it's a good question. I, I think that the last thing that the Saudis will want to do is get dragged into a ground war in Yemen. Um, their, their initial um, forays in 2009 were not uh, terribly successful. Uh, and even with their intervention in 2015, they really turned the ground operations over to the Emiratis. Uh, they, for the most part, have, have stayed away from that and prefer to, uh, to maintain their air campaign. So uh, I, I don't see the Saudis going in, um, you know, uh, uh, in any significant way into a ground war in, in Yemen. I think that's a, a that's a formula for quagmire and, and a very unhappy ending. Um, uh, but but you know but it's it's a good question. Uh, what what is going to happen? And I would have to say this is also true from a U.S. perspective. I think that the last thing that we want to see from a national security perspective is a Houthi military victory. Uh, and so uh, and so the question will be if it does look if matter were to fall. And it did look like the Houthis were going to try once again to uh, to unify and, and gain uh, control of all of Yemen. Uh, I think it's a big question about what we would do. I would certainly think that the that the Saudis would uh, would intensify their air war, uh, not necessarily on the ground. And I did want to make one other point, if I may, before we uh, turn over, and that is you know, the whole question about. Um, you know, and, and Bruce refers to it in his paper as well, and I agree with him on this. Uh, the Houthis are not a, 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 an Iranian proxy. Uh, I think that we need to be careful in not assuming that the Iranians, even if they decide to be helpful in ending the war, can deliver the, uh, the Houthis. The Houthis have their own objectives. Uh, they started this conflict for their own reasons, uh, and they will end the conflict based on their own calculations. The Iranians can influence them. I think that the Houthis can't ignore what Iran says, uh, but I don't think that the Iranians have the, uh, the power or the capacity to pull the plug on the conflict, even if they chose to do that. Let me say, uh, Jerry, it didn't surprise me that you started off by saying you disagree with the points that Bruce made in his chapter. And I should say that, you know, I think if, if I had to guess what Bruce would say, if he were here based on what he wrote in, in the book. And he made very strong critiques of the decision-making in Saudi Arabia. He's very critical of, of MBS. But I think his position would be that Saudi Arabia needs to disengage completely, just walk away um, and, and stop its engagement. And, and that's not gonna happen. Uh, what you're saying is that if anything, Saudi Arabia is more concerned and perhaps it's gonna return to its air campaign that it started off with um, back in 2015. 
Yeah, I would, I, I would dispute the notion that Saudi Arabia could ever walk away. I mean, in the same way that if we saw a hostile force on our border, with, you know, the U.S.-Mexican border, could we just ignore it? You know, could, could we afford to walk away from it? Of course not. Uh, you know, for Saudi Arabia, uh, the idea that, that Yemen would become an Iranian, uh, you know, uh, an Iranian uh, you know, foothold in the Arabian Peninsula, it would be uh, an existential threat. Uh, and so I don't, I, I don't believe that they could uh, afford, afford to do that. And let me also make the point that, um, you know, again, from an international perspective, we can't afford to have the Saudis walk away from Yemen uh, because somebody is going to have to rebuild Yemen. Uh, and, uh, and if it's not Saudi Arabia, it's not going to be the U.S., it's not going to be Europe, it's not going to be anybody else. Uh, so we need to make sure that the war ends on terms that the Saudis can find comfort in uh, and that would uh, keep them engaged in Yemen going forward.